So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, everyone. Today, inshallah, we're going to continue with Surah Al-Ahzab and the good news. We're actually on the last page of Surah Al-Ahzab. Hopefully, we can finish today. Um, so, last time, let's kind of um, just review what we did last time. We did talk about um, comparing the or the harm that was that was um, inflicting or they were harming the Prophet ﷺ with along with the believers and along with the believing women and how in the end Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala collects all that harm with one reason with one main thing which is to um, to stop uh, spreading the good or to stop those that are holding on to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from practicing their uh, pr- practicing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words and practicing the the principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had um, had uh, obligated the Muslims to practice. We talked about that part and we also talked about hijab. We did talk a little bit about hijab because we talked about it before so we're not going to do it again. Um, we also talked about um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course threatening the munafiqeen and threatening the kuffar as well in um, the harm that they were doing in Medina and what that will uh, that and what that will be resulting in and then of course it goes into sunnah Allah fi alladhina khalaw min qabl wa lan tajida li sunnati Allah tabdila now this is a very this is one of the ayat al-mutashabihat and this is really important because when we're talking about al-ayat al-mutashabihat it you know they're they're different in in different ways and they're also similar in different ways but you could see that the context that it was laid in in where in where sunnah allah fi alladhina khalaw min qabl so sunnah allah fi alladhina khalaw min qabl in where there is a pattern a pattern in where the those that denied the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those that are that um, that are whether munafiqeen or the hypocrites or whether they were the mushrikeen in how they reacted toward the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time how they reacted with the believers and towards the believers or towards the prophets and that that pretty much is a pattern so when we look at the word sunnah we're talking about a pattern in other words this ayah is actually telling us that what you had seen with the prophet and the way the munafiqeen the way the mushrikeen the way the ahli kitab or etc were reacting um were reacting towards the believers and towards the prophet was pretty much going to be the same story so it's it you know in in, in other words in order for you to understand the future to understand how they're going to treat you as a modern believer is pretty much going to be the same pattern the same way in the way they reacted with those that had come before you and this is when it talks about sunnat allahi fil ladina khalaw min qabl it's the same pattern the, the the pattern of those that came before you and of course those that came before you meaning sunnat Allah was the pattern where the disbelievers um, had rejected the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also the pattern in where the believers were hanging on and and of course being patient um, in 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 um, in facing the reaction and the way that they were assaulting uh, the believers. So the assault is nothing new, and neither is and neither is the the rejection. The rejection is nothing new, and neither is the assault. It's not new as well. At the same time, in here it's actually um, considering. We're, we're, we're looking at two sides where there is a pattern that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had set the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also the reaction of the people and also the reaction of the believers etc and at the same time the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so all that you know the whole story When whenever you look at a story you're talking about a character uh, you're talking about the good people you're talking about the bad people you're talking about the events you're talking about um, the purpose you're talking about the theme so all that makes it makes the different uh, the different um, uh, the different categories in a story so when we're looking at sunnah Allah the story is the same 
maybe it is unfolding in a different way with a different uh, with a different um, uh, with a different event but the story is really practically the same in where there is a message there is a mission there is a rejection to that message there is an eff an, an effort and uh, an ener energy and and power using military using um, uh, diplomacy using um, politics etc in order to refute in order to attempt to um, to reject or even eliminate that message and at the same time the believers will fight back so now in this part of it so Sunnah is talking about how the story unfolds in the different categories about it and in the other part it's actually that the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're not going to find it any different in where the sharia when we're talking about the sharia it's really important to mention that not everything in the details of sharia is necessarily the same as the details of a sharia from from the different uh, from the different decades or the different um, the earlier prophets let's call it that way because the earlier prophets they did have a different Sharia ah, and that's why we would find the Sharia ah, the Sharia ah that came previously with Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, Prophet Adam alayhi salam, Musa etc the Sharia ah was different it was suiting their times it was suiting their times, it was certain suiting their circumstances. But then finally the Sharia, Sharia Muhammad وسلم, was the only Sharia that was a universal Sharia, meaning that it was the final Sharia to suit that time and the decades and the ages and the centuries to come. Now here's a question. Scholars, when we're looking at did, did we necessarily can we use the Sharia ah that was in the previous uh, the, the previous eras during previous prophets can we use that as the sharia ah or the sharia ah to depend on in order to say that something is halal or haram or not let's give an example an example remember when prophet musa alayhi salam went and ran away from the pharaoh because that man got killed even though he didn't necessarily intend to kill the man he just فوكزه, he just you know just gave him a, a little nod or a little push and the guy just dropped dead now can we when prophet musa alayhi salam ran to the man the man well ran to that city this that man that salih man and it wasn't necessarily it wasn't necessarily shuaib but that good man that pious man um basically uh asked him to marry one of his daughters he marries one of his daughters now this this part where that he's actually doing that engagement, that proposal for Prophet Musa alayhi salam, and it wasn't the opposite way. This is one example. Another example where Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam um, sees that they were actually doing sujood. His father, his mother, and his brothers were actually doing sujood for him. He's another example. So we we would get a number of different stories. Or um, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. So when Prophet Ibrahim's wife Sarah she comes in and the malaika were you know in Surah Al-Variyat um, they said well you're going to be getting a child and then فَسَكَّتْ وَجَهَا وَقَالَتْ عَجُوزٌ عَقِيمٌ she slapped her face and she said عَجُوزٌ عَقِيمٌ he's just an old man she or whether she's talking about herself or whether she's talking about Prophet Ibrahim عَجُوزٌ عَقِيمٌ that we're right now she is a, a a barren old woman and he is a barren old man so how is it that we're going to be getting children um although it would make more sense for her to talk about herself than prophet ibrahim alayhi salam but in the end is that well we haven't had children all these years how is it that i was that she was going to get um pregnant in an old age when she was barren even when she was able to conceive during her earlier um earlier um um ages now that's the same thing in where fasakka she slapped her face different examples as um as the evidence that something is permissible or not now one all scholars would agree that if the sharia ah of muhammad the sharia ah that was sent unto sharia ah muhammad if 
it, it abrogated a certain law that that would be abrogated and that would be called mansukh and therefore it would be haram. So, for example, Sayyidah Maryam, she actually made the oath that she would not speak to any person, that she would not speak to any person whatsoever and فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَنِ صَوْمَا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيَا She said, I will, she will be making uh, making that um, in nether, that نذرت, she, she's making an oath to never speak to any human being after that incident whatsoever in order to, um, in order to do it as a form of ritual. But in Islam, the Prophet um, was really clear that, you know, th such a way of ritual is not acceptable in Islam. Same thing with the ritual where it was practiced before celibacy was practiced before as a form as a form of ritual as a form of getting closer to God Almighty by the monks they practiced it that way and the ayah actually says at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Prophet Yahya alayhi salam and says or uh, Yahya alayhi salam says Meaning that he abstained from marriage and, you know, this is more of a praise put right there. But you could see that the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu actually abrogated, abrogated certain things that were permissible in previous Sharia's. So that type of abrogation, which is called Nasr, um, is clear and all scholars would agree that that Nasr would take place and that we cannot use that that as an example, although Shafi'iya considered that Shafi'i Madhabi Shafi'i regarded that Wasaidan wa Hasuran is actually an evidence to prove that marriage is um, is not preferred over seeking talab al ilm. But regardless, so when we're looking at what but they would still agree, even the Madhab Shafi'i would still agree that celibacy is not necessarily not necessarily the Sunnah, but they they argued whether it w it is preferred over seeking ilm or not. That's where they uh, they they um, they argued. Uh, that's what they argued on. Um, but at the same time, the second level is where if Islam was quiet about it, and when I say Islam, we're talking about Sharia at Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If in in Islam, um, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, or in other words, the Quran or the Sunnah were quiet about it and didn't mention really anything and did not deny that that's that that's something that is permissible and just didn't mention anything in that situation that is when we say scholars have differences of opinions on whether shari'atu man qablana is it a sharia for us as well or not is it a legislature that we could use as an evidence to prove that yes it's permissible and here's our evidence to use and, and to prove that this is an uh, an, an evidence um is that well during prophet um during prophet let's say uh, musa alayhi salam it was the father that proposed to prophet musa and it wasn't the other way around etc so this this is, this is something that is a long debate and a huge debate between um, the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh. Again, the word is Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh is different than Fiqh because Usul al-Fiqh is pretty much studying the main foundations of legislature, like what acts as a resource and how do we derive a ruling from that resource so that's the science of usul al-fiqh fiqh on the other hand is different because it basically derives the rulings from the resources that an usuli had taught the faqih how to make use and how to go back to those legislatures so when we talk about walan tajida li sunnati allahi tabdila this is an order for us to understand remember how we went to um surah al surah al shura and we talked about um uh, we talked about uh, we talked about the Sharia and we talked about all that. I think we did a whole long discussion before that, uh, b before on that. And this is the Sharia. This is walan tajida li sunnati Allahi tabdila. It is referring to the Sharia in the general meaning. In the general meaning that there is a path. There is there is um uh there are general uh, legal maxims that a Muslim or followers 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or those that wanted to divine to follow the divine in where they had to follow a certain path that is not based on their own whims but that is based on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided people to follow a specific sunnah now another part that we'd like to emphasize on is that walan tajila li sunnati Allahi tabdila in in many times in the Quran it will come to also mean walan tajida li sunnati Allahi tabdila meaning the fitra meaning the fitra walan tajida li sunnati Allahi tabdila to mean the fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sharia all right how do, how is the context here for it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the sharia and the sharia was to do two things number 1 it was to suit the the um it was to suit the general maxims of of um balance which is al mizan all right it was to suit the general balance in al mizan that was number 1 and number 2 now you want to you want to remember that it's really important because when we're talking about when we're talking about sunnah here, we're actually talking about maqasad al-sharia. And when we're talking about maqasad al-sharia, it's really important that we put it in the context in where we understand that it relates to, that even maqasad al-sharia, it relates to il-mizan, it relates to stability, it relates to a certain pattern that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in the world. So we can't... We can't take out Sharia from understanding that it re, that it is actually to suit stability on an individual level and also on a society level. What does it mean to to do the society and the person or individual or a personal level? So what that means is that you cannot you cannot take that out of the main purpose that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the world in. Let me let me break it down even more. You look at DNAIM. Remember that rule, the DNAIM. Let's look at, for example, one of them. We're talking about A for aql, intellect, and we're looking at I, which is al ird, and we're looking at um, family and and of course man. We're to, we're looking at wealth and the distribution of the economy, all these different sides. All right. Now, when we look at the legislature in the way that it will discuss what is good for your mind and why the mind is important to preserve and the, the health the mental health and etc and it also talks about family and why it's important and that's because in order to continue a cycle of justice and a, and a cycle of stability on an individual level in where the person the individual is actually in a good mental health stability and also at a family uh, reproduction and we're continuing the cycle of family continuing the cycle of reproduction and at the same time making sure that the within the society that there are the different categories and the different things that lead to continuing the same pattern that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in this world which is the pattern the pattern that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and the structure of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created not only in the human in the in the, in the human um, world but also in the animal world and the, the different worlds plants etc different worlds in where there is a structure that structure is why sharia was revealed in order to maintain the structure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in this world and when we're talking about the structure of human beings it's a little different because the structure of human beings is also emphasizing the issue of justice. It's emphasizing the issue of justice, which is where we go back to Surah Al-Rahman in where Al-Rahman Allam Al-Quran Khalaq Al-Insan Allamahu Al-Bayan Al-Shamsu Al-Qamar Al-Husban I want you to look at this ayah because this ayah is right at the heart of what we're talking about. Let's look at this ayah. So it says Al-Rahman Allam Al-Quran خلق الإنسان علمه البيان. When we look at those words, we can see that there is the سنة. There's الرحمن uh, علم القرآن. All right. That Allah subhanahu wa taala 
there's a, a certain intellect, there's a certain thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught man, gave man a certain ability, and that is the intellect. The intellect is the source and is, let's say, the heart of what we're going to come across later on in the ayat in order to understand what sunnah are we actually talking about. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ عَلَمْهُ رُبَانَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ بِحُسْبَانَ There's uh, the shams and there's the qamar, there's the, there's the shams, the sun, and the qamar, the moon, and and shams wal qamar bi husban wa najm wa shajar in najm are basically not the not the stars but they're actually the the trees or the plants that grow on ground kind of like the cucumber trees the um let me see watermelon tr- uh, watermelon plants they grow on they grow on uh, on the ground so we see ar rahman uh, grow on ground so now we're seeing wa sama'a rafa'aha wa wada'a al-mizan this is taking us into the categories that that sunnah and again when we say khalaq al-insan this is referring us to the sunnah of fitra again all right now it's taking us to the sunnah of fitra again in order to tell us that the sunnah of fitra is directly connected with وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِزَانِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had then lifted the skies in order to bring about a certain pattern and something that encompasses everything all at once. Everything in the creation all at once. But the emphasis on those ayat in where خَلَقَ insan is really the heart of the other part of it, which is أَلَّا تَطْغَوْ فِي الْمِزَانِ Given man the intellect, given and created everything in this world in order to really do one main, one main purpose. That is man going to live up to the test and up to the principle and apply justice on ground or not. So when we look at وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا we're actually talking about how sharia actually encompasses life justice on uh, on ground and a certain pattern that was created and also man's free will. How is man's free will going into all of this? So that created all those different patterns you're not going to find any change because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the purpose of life and actually made the, the whole structure of life to suit a certain purpose and that purpose is really to test man is really to test man and this is really important to say because وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا is talking about one the essence that preceded the existence meaning the purpose of that preceded that came before our existence that's number one that's this one sunnah the second sunnah is really you as a human being you've got the fitrah why am i created why who created me and what am i supposed to be doing number three that there's a certain individual and a, a, a structure in this whole world which is on a society level in order to bring about a certain stability a certain level of stability and that's why when we look at you're not going to find any change not in the essence and you're not going to find a change not in your own fatra, and you're not going to find any change onto what is needed to bring about justice within the society. I know this is a little bit philosophical for some, but it's really important that we actually hit that ground and understand what actually makes those different sides, those different sides of, 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 of a sunnah, or when we're talking about a structure within the society. If you find... And if you get to that structure and understanding that base in understanding the structure of what makes a sharia, then it's going to be really easy for you to deconstruct a lot of the different philosophies that are right now um, indoctrin- indoctrinating our societies, whether we're talking about feminism, whether we're talking about secularism, um, postmodernism. Once you understand that structure and where and what Islam is really based on and those different sides, the essence 
that precedes the existence number two in where the the the, the human being and the fitra on the inside number three the structure and the which is the legal maxim the maqas of the sharia that keeps all these different categories together on an individual level and on a society level then you had actually brought the main foundation to deconstructing a lot of those different philosophies that may bring about a narrative that may seem very catchy and that may seem like it makes a lot of sense and may seem very uh, again I, the, the, I can't really find a, a word other than uh, catchy to be an appropriate term in this sense yes now we go into the other part yes so who was the one that was asking there's actually a number of different a number of different times that uh, there would be different people that would be asking about this sa'a, that would be asking, what is this sa'a? This sa'a is not, you know, a watch, but it's actually the last hour. It's the last hour, it's the day of judgment. Now, here's the thing. There are actually different kinds of people that asked about this sa'a. So we look at um, some that were asking about a sa'a, those that were denying a sa'a, just like, for example, in the ayah, so talked about that some people are just hurrying the hour, those that don't really believe in it. So why are they hurrying it? Well, they're just saying, you know, just like... Um, uh, just like um, that, that kafir that actually said that he was making the dua, literally making the dua, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would uh, amtar alayna hijaratan min t- uh, or uh, ya Allah, you know, send um, stones over us and let it rain with stones. It's like, oh, wait, <laughs> this is, this is, this is his dua. This aluka nasu an is sa'a, in where you could see us alunaka an is sa'a, in where it is talking about those that were rejecting his sa'a. Those were one type of people that were asking about a sa'a. The other part, the other people, um, those that were really believing in a sa'a, it was, those were also asking about a sa'a. But the reason why they were asking about the sa'a, or the last hour was really because والذين آمنوا مشفقون منها ويعلمون أنها الحق. So the believers would be asking about a sa'a because they're feeling uh, they're مشفقون منها. They're feeling the fear. They're feeling very emotional about it. They're they're feeling um, they're they're having those feelings of of um, fear of hope and of um, those feelings of wanting to to. Um, wanting to um, get as much as they can from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why they were concerned about the sa'a. Now the other types of people that were asking about a sa'a were really the people were really the people that are part of the mu'mineen but the reason why they were asking about it was because they they just wanted to know certain things about what's going to happen. Now, here's one very important thing. A lot of times people just want to know uh, about the signs of Judgment Day, you know, Ashrat al-Sa'a and Alamat al-Sa'a, just because it feels... It, it kind of fills our love for mysterious things or our, our love to know the future and all those different different sides. But in the end is that for the mu'mineen, the reason why they would ask in learning about Yawm al-Qiyamah and Alamat uh, al-Sa'a is not an issue of mulah uh, al-ilm. It's not just an issue of, yeah, let's entertain ourselves here. This is not an entertainment. But this is... When you precaution somebody, when you are precautioning somebody, you are you are pre-informing and pre-warning someone. You're actually pre-arming someone. You're getting them prepared for those events. When you get them prepared for those events, you're getting them. Uh, you're getting them um, stronger in facing those different um, those different. Um, uh, those different events in where it might actually be something that may put them in the risk of that fitna that will be coming um, that will be coming at them. <coughs> now that's why um, il, uh, we know that a hadith where uh, well we've got a number of sahaba where they were actually asking. Uh, there's a hadith where the a man came to the Prophet and actually says Mata Sa'a. So the Prophet says, Mat uh, uh, talaha? What did you prepare for it? But the man's response was, Well, all I didn't really prepare much of salah or siyam, but I only prepared one thing. Um, 
my love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. So the Prophet ﷺ actually responded to that. You are with whom you love. You are with whom you love. Now the other the other types that we're asking about is Sa'a are the people um where uh hold on, sorry. Uh, are the people that were really just as from a from a sense of sar a sarcasm so they were really wanting to be sarcastic and that's why they were asking about it so in this area who was really asking um so here it's including in this all right in this all the people all the different types of people that were asking about a sa'a whether they were the believers or whether they were the disbelievers or whether they were the people that wanted to know just give us some more hints and more details to help us prepare so all those would be included in it and here that is why when we look at that al this is the inclusive al so it's talking about all the people that might ask when is it sa'a just give them one response qul inma ilmuha indallah the knowledge and all the knowledge about is sa'a is really with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is really similar to the hadith. Uh, to the hadith, we, we call it the hadith Jibreel. Hadith Jibreel in where he, when he came to the Prophet Sallallahu and again, Jibreel was in the form of a human, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know the hadith, we talked about it a number of times. And he, um, he asked him one of the, one of those questions. He says, um, tell me about his sa'a, tell me about the last hour. And his response was, the person that is asking has no more information than the person that is being questioned than the person that is being questioned here so the questioner doesn't have any more information than the than the uh than the person that is being questioned and this is to tell you not the malaika and tell tell us not the malaika and not even the prophets and no one in this in this whole world whether from the unseen or the seen actually has any information about when it's going to happen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the knowledge of his sa'a with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you never know la'alla the word la'alla La'alla is giving us that um, uh, la'alla is giving us that uh, that feeling that it it could be in other words prepare yourself it is possible it could be very near it could be that the sa'a is really near without you realizing now we do know that there are a number of hadith where the prophet sallam every single friday or every time for example the the the, the skies were filled filled with dark clouds the prophet sallam would be really scared because he would think that he would feel again well that's because he was living the sense that a sa'a a sa'a could be near it could be any minute that you can't necessarily think that oh it's far and that's why in the ayat ata amrullah fala tastajilu in the in the ayat ata amrullah now here's here's the thing the word ata ata is in the past tense so how is it ata when it didn't fala tastajilu is this an oxymoron a paradox right in the same ayat no Ata Amrullah in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the future and the past to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really one. Is really one. So Ata Amrullah where the matter of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's the judgment day, whether it's the past and the future to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really the same. Fala tastajilu, which is from your sense. Your sense as a human being, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, and that's why you may hurry some things. فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُوا فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُوا And this is in order to tell you for you, you live within the paradigm of time. You live within the dimension where you cannot know the future unless you live within a certain time. You can't surpass it. At the same time, you can't surpass history. So you live within the dimension of time, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not live within the dimension of time. So for you, he says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ With the same exact 
with the same exact um, uh, with the same exact form structure in the language structure wa and thalata in where it is putting it in a future tense wa ma yudrika you don't know you you have no idea and because you have no idea you have no knowledge about it now this is more of like an iltifat this is more directing you well because you don't know when it is all you need to do is really do one thing it could be near in other words the most important thing is not when it's going to come but the most important thing is that you would actually have a preparation for it because that is what matters to you what matters to you is are you prepared for that day because it could be near because at the end of the day even if even if you would die that is your qiyama whoever dies if you die your qiyama has already started right there so takunu qariba it involves your individual your individual sense of when the qiyama is going to happen because once you die it that is the start of your qiyama inna allaha la'ana al-kafirina wa a'adda lahum sa'ira now this is related to the ayat that actually came uh, that came previously inna allaha la'ana al-kafirina now here's the thing is that when we look at that those ayat all right la'ana al-kafirin wa a'adda lahum so is this actually talking about that this part is in the dunya and this part is in the akhirah? This is one interpretation. That la'ana al-kafirin, the word la'ana to mean distant. So la'ana al-kafirin, well, why were they distant? Well, that's because they chose to be distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the word la'ana can mean distant and can also mean cursed. So how is distant and cursed? Two together are actually coming to mean the word lana. Well, if the person chooses to be distant, that in itself is actually a curse. How is that a curse? Well, when you are distant, you're living to your own whims in where that in itself is actually is actually putting you to decide your own life and therefore your curse is to actually live in the struggles of your own decision making when in reality that decision making that you would be making is nothing bringing you of any type of a happiness when in reality it is just going to bring you evil the evil that was brought to you was brought to you by none other by by, by, by yourself so here la'ana al-kafirin la'ana al-kafirin in where they were distant in this dunya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distant them in the akhirah and or um, the other interpretation is that they were distant in the dunya they were distant in the dunya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which is why in yawm al-qiyamah they will be distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, so it's al-jaza'u min jins al-amal. What do we mean by al-jaza'u min jins al-amal? The same, the, the punishment is going to be from the same kind, from the same type of that behavior, of that action. So for example, you steal, it's your hand that we're going to be dealing with. You decide to you decide to um, uh, uh, close your eyes on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you on judgment day as blind, um, in which is where uh, that they will be actually blind on judgment day because um, be, because they had um, not seen or because they had ignored um, or even uh, shed their eyes away from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is as in Surah Taha in where they would say uh, 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 where the A would actually say it if you remind me the A um, uh, the A says um وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى Now correlating these two sides together in where that أعرض عن ذكري ومن أعرض عن ذكري those that distance themselves away from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or أعرض turned away from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِشَةً ضَنْكَ 
in where their ma'isha, their life is going to be distanced. Their life is going to be uh, banka is where it's going to be full of confusion, it's where it's going to be full of pains, full of sorrows, full of hardship. Why? Because they decided to distance themselves away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, don't blame no one but yourself. It was really, it was really a, your own contribution. It was really your own self. So you distance yourself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You ended up harvesting the pains that you're living. The pains that you're living are really because of your own actions, because of your own behavior. You decided to take that step, and now you're you're harvesting the steps that you had decided to take. فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى And on judgment day, they will be resurrected blind. قَالَ رَبِّي لَمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى They would say, Oh Allah, why did you resurrect me blind when I was... Uh, when I was um, uh, when I was able to see, in other words, I wasn't blind in the dunya. قال كذلك أتتك آياتنا. Well, that's because in the same way. Now, the word كذلك is telling us that there is a certain pattern that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala always puts in this world and even in the akhirah. That there's a certain sequence that does not leave this life. قال كذلك أتتك آياتنا. Then the same pattern, the same pattern, the same sequence. You received the message. You decided to desert. You decided to desert those messages. You decided to turn your back on them. You decided to um, ignore them. You decided to. Um, uh, you decided to leave them well now fanasitaha now the word fanasitaha does not necessarily mean forgotten them because that's why when we actually talk about the word nasit nas um we remember Allah if you forget it's not if you remember Allah if you if you forget because he's already forgotten if we're going to translate that we're not going to translate that as that the person had already forgotten. So it makes no sense to actually say with Qurrabaka Ida Nasit to mean Nasit to mean forgotten. Because the word Nasit here does not mean that the person had forgotten. So it makes no sense, oh I I I forgot and therefore I rem I reminded myself. Well anyways they they forgot. So how is how is it that they're reminding themselves? So the word Nasit would actually mean pacified yourself away or got pacified with something all right so what could in a seat once you get pacified with something take a moment to do your dhikr all right so in the same sense here then fanasitaha means you ignored it. You were pacified away from it. Were they there? Did you know about it? Yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish you if you forgot something. The evidence in where the Prophet actually says in Allah the Jawazili an Ummati al Khata when Nisyan Bama. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uplifted the punishment on the ummah for three things. Al-Khata, something that they had done by mistake. and nisyan something that they had forgotten about. And something that they were coerced with. They were forced to do something. It wasn't what they wanted to do. They didn't have the intention to do it, but they were forced to do it. Now, we could see category two, which is in Nisyan. To forget something, you won't be punished for forgetting. But here, the word fanasitaha, uh, uh, in that A that we just mentioned, is actually talking about to ignore, to get pacified for, from, from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ignore it and decide to take your own self as the reference and as the as the, the the one to determine to do something or not. All right. So here, Lahan al kafirin is is actually in the same category. How we connected it with Surah Taha right there, in where they distance the, they distance themselves, and therefore al kafirin they distance themselves from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and now they're getting the punishment of being distant from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Wa adda lahum wa adda lahum sa'ira. Now because of the fact. That they distanced themselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the Sharia. Now Adalahum Sahira. So now they had prepared for themselves. In other words, why is it why did it say Adda? The word Adda would mean that would mean that um prepared. So prepared, why prepared? Well that's because they decided to take a certain stance. They decided to they did they decided 
to take a certain behavior, to um, do a certain behavior. So now, when you when you do something, you are by by definition when you're doing something, or by default, not by definition, but by default, when you're doing something, that means you're awaiting a certain response, a certain cause, and in fact, you're waiting. You do a certain matter, and you're waiting for a certain result. And here, the result is what result? Well, the result of them distancing, the, uh, the result of uh, distancing themselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really, that the, that brings in the effect. The effect is, lahum sa'ira. The effect to that distancing that they had decided to take is the a'adda lahum. They were, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared for them, sa'ira. And here, lahum is in order to say, you know, this is just for them. The word sa'ira would mean a blazing and in, in, in blazing fire, but the word sa'ira is mean, um, uh, it really means, um, sa'ira is to mean, uh, where it is, it is blazing and extremely heated. In, in, in other words, it's, it's, um, sa'ira, okay, I'm, I, I guess, uh, I, I need to, Find the words here. Sa'ira is it's prepared and a heated, uh, prepared heat before it even before it even is ignited. And this is really important. Before it's even ignited, it is actually blazing. Sa'ira, khalidina fiha abada, khalidina fiha abada. And this is to say right here when we look at khalidina fiha abada. خالدين فيها أبدا لا يجدون وليا ولا نصيرا. So now the determination, since they had taken those steps to distance themselves away from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, now the trial has come. The trial is that there's the preparation. They distance themselves from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prepared for them before they even had gotten into the trial. It was a preparation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what they were heading for. So, khalidina fiha abada. Now comes the trial where they're going to be, they're going to be living there eternally. In other words, this is after death. Okay. So here, this is talking to us about during life. During their life, they distanced themselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jahannam is already getting prepared, is already prepared it is already built it's right there it's actually there currently right now it is actually prepared and on judgment day now here we go they die and here you could see that there was a that time lapse that the a didn't really at least in in this context at least in in, in this part it didn't really talk about the middle part in where what <coughs> happens when they die and where they go etc it just left it well you know, we mentioned that in other parts. But now, after that death, there is no other death. Now, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings death uh, on, a, on an imin image of a kapshin amlah. A kapsh is a ram. So it's a white a big, huge ram. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ask the people in hellfire and ask the people in Jannah, do you know who this is? Now, of course, then, well, this is death. Death is then slaughtered. How can you slaughter death? Well, remember, death is a creature according to Surah Al-Mulk. Tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa alayka ulu shayin qadir. Alladhi khalaqa al-mawta wal-hayata. Wait a minute. Khalaqa al-mawta created death well, hayata. So why create death before you even create life? Well, here's the thing, is that you were dead anyways, and then created life. So in other words, death was something that was already there. You knew about it, and then life was actually the second thing that came after that. This is to tell us that death and life are both actually creatures. That's it, that it, that it, it itself actually has life to it. Now this is really to tell us that the reasoning to creating life and death, in other words, existence, and what we put it in just one terminology, existence is really to bring about a test. 
Now, when we look at Khalidina Fiha, this is in order to tell us that transition in the Akhirah is that it's going to be eternal. There's no coming back. There's no death going to be happening. لا يجدون ولي ولا نصيرا. Now, لا يجدون ولي ولا نصيرا. What? How does it fit within the coherence of these ayat? Well, remember, لا يجدون ولي ولا نصيرا. Remember that the munafiqin and the the story of Surah Al Ahzab is pretty much the 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 era during the time of Ghazwat Al Khandaq during the time. So we're talking about the fifth year Hijrah, and there was a whole time lapse and a whole time lapse within that frame in where the Munafiqin were really supporting the the Jews and the Jews or at least Bani Quraiza were really um trying to while well, they already created their alliance with um Bani Nadir and created their alliance with the uh, with the uh, Arab tribes Ghatafan and and so forth now the other alliance that was coming in was Bani Quraiza were Bani Quraiza that were wanting to commit the treason in order to let a safe a safe entrance for that other alliance in order to have them go inside Medina and bring a total end to the people, um, to the Muslims that were in Medina. So here they actually thought that they were getting an alliance, and of course a whole uh, formidable group, a whole uh, a whole strong group in where. They were really aiming to eliminate the Muslims in Medina. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La yajiduna waliya wa la nasira. In that time, it, for that time, it was really talking about that they're not going to be able to find in Jahannam. They won't be finding a wali or somebody a supporter. What is al wali and what is in nasir al wali is really the leader. in nasir is the supporter. So what is the difference? Il wali is the main leader that leads you to something. But the leader acts as the person to take and that you trust in order to make the decisions for you and on your behalf. But the nasir, the nasir is the person that you would get and feel that they will support me whenever I'm there, whenever I'm I'm in need, whenever the wali might actually make a wrong decision the nasir would be there as a backup to help me get at least to my um my uh, my refuge or at least help me get into a safe haven so this is basically telling us well they're not going to have a wali they're not going to have the leader in other words they're not going to have that authority to help them out of this dilemma that they had put themselves in there's no way because even those leaders we're going to go into further those ayat we're going to see what happens to those leaders those leaders they themselves were uh, will actually say well we've got nothing to do with them it was really they uh, it was really the decision that they had decided to take on their own so let's continue wala nasira wala nasira no supporter yawma tuqallabu wujuhuhum fi an-nar yaquluna ya laytana ata'na Allah wa ata'na ar-rasul now here we go يَوْمَ تُقَلَّبُ وُجُوهُهُمْ فِي النَّرِ So on that day, and this is going into further details about how are they going to be living there um, eternally. يَوْمَ تُقَلَّبُ So this is giving us an idea. يَوْمَ تُقَلَّبُ وُجُوهُهُمْ فِي النَّرِ On that day, their faces تُقَلَّبُ The word تُقَلَّب, um, scholars actually have differences of opinions on the word, on, on this ayah. Is it that on Judgment Day, نَسْأَلُّهَا الْعَفْوَ الْعَافِيَ On Judgment Day, is it that they're, they're going to be, um, uh, they're going to be changed in their positions or are they going to be changing their position so the word tuqallab you could see it's a passive voice here yawma tuqallab wujuhum in where is it the malaika that are flipping their faces and flipping them to get more of the torture or is it that they themselves are wanting now usually whenever you fear something um let's say you know a car was driving past you and filled you up with water the first thing that you're going to do is really wipe your face 
and then worry about your clothes and the rest of your body. Your face is your first concern. And that's why you would put the mask, you would put all everything, you know, on your face. And we know that during COVID, you know, the issue of mask and covering the face was really because it's really the main entrance to the rest of the body. It has the most holes in it. And those holes act as the main area that brings in the dangerous issues or even exits the dangerous issues or um secretes uh, dangerous issues out of our body and that's why when you go to the doctor the first thing they're going to tell you open your mouth look into your nose look into your ears because that those openings give us a lot of information about what's going inside and what's being uh what's uh, what's exiting outside that's our only that's our only um loophole to look inside the body those are the areas and here when we're looking at this is actually talking about that how the 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 kuffar themselves are actually even trying to protect their faces trying to protect their faces um from this this uh this hellfire the blazing hellfire and they would say يقولون. they would say ya laytana ata'na allah now here the here goes the remorse ya laytana ya laytana is a word of remorse it's isn't fi'l in where word of remorse oh we wish but of course that wish that hope is right now more of a regret and a remorse of the past Allah. now why bring up Allah? because this is this is the the area where they had previously actually taken something instead now with a wali of a mu'min the wali of a mu'min Hasbunallah wa ni'ma al That's what we would say. We would consider that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our wali, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one to take the decision for us. We would consider Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the place to tell us halal haram. In other words, decision, do this, but don't do that. And then you've got the choice. Select your choices from the halal areas. So that is the wali. Now here, they would say, we wish that they had, they would, they would say, uh, that they had wished that they had obeyed Allah Almighty and ata'ana rasula ata'ana rasula notice here they said ata'ana Allah wa ata'ana rasula as a supporter so here remember waliyan and nasira because the uh, the rasul alayhi salatu wasalam is really that the area to support you to learn how to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn how to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you don't say ata'ana Allah uh, or here um, when the when that man that sahabi that made the khutbah and he said um, you know to obey Allah and and the messenger or if you don't obey them together and you put them together and the Prophet Sallam actually said you know what a horrible uh, what a horrible preacher you are why because you put Allah and his messenger on the same level so here ata'ana Allah and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a higher level of obedience to and of course by obeying the Prophet peace be upon him you're actually obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in practice you're putting that obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in practice by by seeing how the man prophet sallam actually actually um um practiced islam now here we go so what their um excuse was and they said rabbana now this is really important because this is actually looking at the structure in that you know again وَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا Is this necessarily um, a conversation before even going into hellfire? Or is this a conversation after? Scholars really had uh, uh, differences of opinions here. وَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا They said, O oh, our Lord, inna أَطَعْنَا We had obeyed سَادَتَنَا our leaders, our chieftains, those that are in in a in a in a higher position within our communities, wakubara'ana. And the difference between sadatana wa kubara'ana, you've got the sada, which are the leaders, al kubara, those are the that those that are pretty much following al sada. So you've got their different levels of leaders. You've got the president and you've got those that are under and in there were the executives and those that are making the decisions and those are the supporting the, the supporting 
uh, the supporting groups for the for the leaders and those that will investigate, those that will uh, put in the different laws to make sure that the that the leader actually um, has his words um, implemented. All those different things. So now, فَأَضَلُّونَ sabila Those are the people that had adaluna. Now the word adaluna. So they said, well, you know, we just obeyed those leaders whether in, whether in our times whether they're political leaders or whether they were the or whether they were um even in the name of education they can come those are those are considered leaders or in the name of media those in the name of celebrities those are all considered you know the the main people in where they're following them Luna sabila in other words they were the ones that misguided us they they put it in a certain narrative they forced us to do certain things. Adaluna sabila. Now the word adaluna would actually get you the hint. It would give us the hint. Adaluna that they they had used the word balal. What is the word balal? Balal is notice that it wasn't forcing them because they did have they did have the decision. <clears throat> and they did have the capacity to decide to leave, to decide to not obey, whether in secret or in different ways. But here, the Luna Sebile, that they actually they, they actually fell for it. In other words, they were seeing the indoctrination, they were seeing the narrative, and they fell for the narrative. In other words, they actually believed it. They actually went along that misguidance they took it into practice and they actually implemented in implemented it in their life and that's why when we look at other luna sabila they're now trying to find a way to uplift the the punishment off of them by accusing the leaders and those in those positions that they were the ones that actually practiced that so uh, that type of um, uh, delusion and they just happen to fall for it in other words they're trying to say it's not our fault it's their fault so why let us get all the blame for it or get into all all that now it's really equivalent to where the a actually says لقد أضلني عن الذكر when they actually actually says about those uh, about the لقد أضلني عن الذكر when when the the friend would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala well this friend it's his fault لقد أضلني عن الذكر and would consider that it's not my fault he's the one it's his fault أضلني عن الذكر he actually deluded me away from dhikr and we said before that the word dhikr so here is sabil is sabil and dhikr is all those different different names um for the for the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now why here sabila and not dhikr so the word sabil sabil is really remember let's go back to the ayat in where it was talking about here sunnatillah li sunnatillah and the sunnatillah is actually we said sunnatillah can be in the sharia and we talked about sunnatillah can also be in uh the uh, can also be in the different structures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created we talked about fitra as well and we also talked about we also talked about the essence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in this world. So that's why when you look at the word sabila and not dhikr here, it's talking about the general paths. It's talking about the three paths that we had mentioned. The essence, the two, the fitra, and three, the sharia that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had actually, had actually regarded that 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 was guidance all right Lehuda. now that's why when we look at the sabila they were talking about one in understanding their essence and understanding what they were created for two that they actually practiced the form of where they pacified them away from their own fitra and three in where the when it came to practicing sharia that they pacified them away from practicing the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember these three different categories so by the way I would like to mention here that why is it rasula sabila it is uh, what is um same, same very 
both for poetic reasons, let's say it that way, um, poetic reasons, in other words, to bring about, um, bring about the, the, that, um, uh, that the ending of the ayat to sound the same, which is really um, not many in those ayat, but أطعنا الرسول سبيلا, and this is known in لغة عربية. ربنا آتهم ضعفين. Now, notice here they said ربنا ربنا. When do you say ربنا ربنا? When do you when do you use this frequently? Because it's your only hope. O Lord Almighty. Now they're calling on to the Lord Almighty because they're hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would answer them. آتهم ضعفين آتهم ضعفين من العذاب. Now they said, O oh Allah, give them ضعفين من العذاب. Give them. Now here the word ضعفين, it doesn't mean double per se, but the word ضعفين can also mean a continuous, could, continuous or um, uh, something that is endless. Okay, so, um, which is when we look at, for example, when we look at the ayah, ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير. So when we look at ارجع البصر كرتين, all you need to really see is really just once. All right, and, and that, that's all it needs. You look at it, you not recognize it, and therefore it makes a thought in your mind, and you you process it. All right. So here, when we look at karatain or dhafain, it doesn't necessarily mean just double in the literal term double, but it actually means continuous or an increase or an increase in the torture. So they were hoping that you know what increase them in the torture, in the torture that they they are in. But in Surah Al-Araf, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala explains that and says. قَالَ لِكُلِّ ضِعْفِ Each one is going to get an increase based on their their action, based on the behavior. So لِكُلِّ ضِعْفِ Each one is going to get an increase in the torture. One, the 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 the, the increase in the torture for those that you know deluded the people, and an increase in torture torture for even accepting to be deluded. أَتِهِمْ ضِعْفَيْنِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ So they said, you know, increase. Double, let that torture be double the amount. Well, anhum la'nan kabira. Now, they're they're cursing the leaders that they were hoping, and of course, they're the Sada and the Kubara that they were hoping at one point that they were going to be, that they were going to be um, uh, saved and by following their path. Well, anhum la'nan kabira. Ya Allah. Well, anhum la'nan kabira and distance them. When we say la'nan kabira, this is maf'ul mutlaq right there in order to say and let it be a literal distancing. So in Lugh Arabi, when we say la'nan, la'anhum la'nan, you know, when we use the word and then another term in English, it's really just like when we say, I literally mean such. So here they're saying and distance them a literal magnificent or a huge distance away from you that way they will not find any way of getting in any any slight of um of a, of a hope of getting any any kind of any kind of a acceptance or any kind of a dismissal from the torture in other words now they're putting all their hatred and this right now is just telling you of the amount of pain that they're feeling in where you know what and let them be ever ever distant and don't let them get a, 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 a light or any way of hope and let them be distant forever and in a huge distance now this is talking to the believers again here's the where's the shift right here it's not a shift really but this is the same with the same ayat going into the same coherence in where it's telling the believers don't harm the prophet don't harm the prophet why not harm the prophet what, what, what does this have to do with the previous ayat remember the whole surah was talking about was talking about during the time of the Prophet al Khandaq, how they reacted, how the Munafiqeen were reacting to harm the Prophet Sallallahu family and the Prophet Sallallahu himself. And here's the thing, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Now this is talking to the believers. Before it was talking to the Munafiqeen, La takunu kalladheena adha Musa. 
don't be like those that um, that harmed Prophet Musa. Wait a minute, I thought they were believers. Why would they harm the Prophet? Well, it can happen that even a believer might actually harm the Prophet ﷺ or harm the Prophets in certain ways. Would they still be believers? Well, just a second. We'll get to that. We'll talk about um, uh, one, that they might intentionally want to harm the Prophet and but that will get them out of out of the fold of Islam. But unintentionally harm the Prophet when they didn't necessarily mean a harm to the Prophet and which is really, really similar when the ayah was revealed and you know that I am a prophet to you when he was saying لِمَ تُؤْذُونَنِي وَقَدْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ That was just like Prophet, um, Prophet uh, Isa alayhi salam لِمَ تُؤْذُونَنِي وَقَدْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ إِذَيَ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ uh, or This is actually Prophet Musa alayhi salam in where they were harming Prophet Musa alayhi salam So how did, how was Prophet Musa alayhi salam harmed? In different ways. Number one in where they told Prophet Musa alayhi salam, فَذْهَبْ أَنْتَ وَرَبُّكَ فَقَاتِلَ They told Prophet Musa alayhi salam when he ordered them for jihad, they said, you and your Lord go fight uh, the Palestinians, you and your Lord go fight them yourselves. Now here, remember, the Palestinians, um, uh, although I'm a Palestinian, okay, but that was our ancestry, okay? Um, so the Palestinians at the time we're actually, it's really strange how the Palestinians oftentimes think that the ayah, and this is something that Yasser Arafat was always doing, in where he you know, was always like, you know, we're al-qawm al-jabbarin. It's like, man, al-qawm al-jabbarin was more of a derogatory term talking about the Palestinians. You're using it in the wrong context here. Al-qawm al-jabbarin, all right? The reason why Bani Israel did not want to did not want to um, uh, for, uh, do the jihad against or in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to actually do the jihad against the people that were living in Palestine um, because they were against against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when they were ordered to do jihad they said oh we can't They're, these people are too mighty these people are too strong we're not we're not gonna go there you know what why don't you and your lord that's Bani Israel the children of Israel talking to Prophet Musa why don't you and your lord go fight them yourselves why why are you asking us to go and wage a war on them why are we fighting them in the beginning just you just do it and your lord together and this is one example in where they harm Prophet Musa said him in other words they were really refraining from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and actually continuing to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second time was when they said to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Atatakhidna huzwa, are you taking us, are you here, you know, mocking us? Are you condescending us? Or do you think we're we're um we're that silly when of course they were ordered to slaughter to slaughter the, the, the cow? All right. So they just said, you know, when you say, are you mocking us? What do you, what do you, in other words, you're accusing Prophet Musa alayhi salam of being sarcastic, of being a clown, of being all these different, all these different, all these different uh, things of what, how they were describing Prophet Musa. Now, the other part in where there is a story, and I, I needed to mention the story because this story is actually mentioned in both Sahih Muslim and Sahih al-Bukhari. The story goes as follows. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, the children of Israel, Bani Israel, they accuse Prophet Musa alayhi salam of of having deformalities, not only mental deformalities, but physical deformalities as well. Part of the physical deformalities that they had accused, in other words, the physical deformalities, they wanted to say, well, this person is is actually, um, you know, with full of different deformalities, therefore he cannot be trusted, and he therefore he cannot be qualified to be a messenger of God Almighty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they accused Prophet Musa alayhi salam, of having a physical deformality, the physical deformality that they did, they wanted to accuse was really a physical deformality that was more of hidden. In other words, it's not exposed. So the physical deformality that they had claimed and it spread within the society is that formality area. Then Prophet Musa.
وعطاه الله Israel that Prophet Musa alayhi salam was actually in different deformalities that they were accusing Prophet Musa of. And remember, the Sharia of the past times is different than the Sharia of our times. The children of Israel, the people of Bani Israel, they used to take showers, and they still do, by the way, until today. They take showers with each other naked. So they would, you know, together, they would be in a, a pool or, uh, what's it called, um, a pool or even a lake or something, and they would all, all the men, you know, they would be with each other naked. So Prophet Musa, Musa alayhi salam, of course, avoided those areas because they were they did not suit a prophet of course not whatsoever so he would avoid those those areas and they actually thought that he was avoiding those areas and not wanting to you know be with them naked was really because he had some kind of a physical deformity that he did not want to expose so one time Prophet Musa alayhi salam was bathing and this hadith is sahih that he was bathing and he put his garment on a rock. The, the garment was put on a rock but the rock, the rock actually distant itself. The rock distant itself. How did it distance distance itself? Um, was it was was there wind that took it away, or what really happened? So in the end, is that the rock moved from its place, and Prophet Musa alayhi salam's garment moved along with that rock. Prophet Musa alayhi salam wanted to get the garment to cover himself because he feared that he would be exposed with his with his body went to uh, get the garment but the rock continued rolling and then prophet musa alayhi salam was seen without those garments without those garments and then they recognize that the stories that they had made up on the Prophet ﷺ were all lies and they were not uh, they were not true on Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Now here's where that uh, that ayah فَبَرَّأَهُ اللَّهُ مِمَّا قَالُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proved them wrong and proved Prophet Musa alayhi salam innocent from all the deformalities whether the mental deformality or whether the physical deformality and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَكَانَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَجِيهَا and that he was in a high position um, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is really important you know because many times now I want you to look at here and in, in where um, the context in where remember many times people would take those leaders uh, those leaders as um, as important leaders or because they think that if by imitating them by following their path that somehow they will get an important position they will be famous they will be put in in somehow uh, in, in, a, in a, on a pedestal and they will be regarded as of important people so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us you know what can and Allah wajiha and there are so many people out there and Nasrullah that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not make us one of those. Not make us one of those. And where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is um is telling us that, you know, even if these people, even if these people regarded that Prophet that Prophet Musa alayhi salam was not of high position and where they put him in place of mockery, put him in place of mockery, put him in place of sarcasm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was actually put in, a, in an important position and therefore the position that you and I should be concerned about is really um, the position in where how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regard us? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regard us? In other words, it's not how people regard you. The position and the, the, the fame is really not in this dunya, but it's actually in the akhirah. And that's why there are many that their names might be mentioned in this dunya. But in the akhirah or by with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their, their names are forgotten. Nasullaha fanasiyahum. And remember, it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember we talked about the word nasiya. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fanasiyahum doesn't mean Nasullaha fanasiyahum. It doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgotten them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not. Let akhudu sinatan wa la nawm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forget. Right? But here, fanasiyahum, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ignored them. 
they ignored Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fanasiyahum. Again, the word nasiyah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ignored them. And this is absolutely coming within that context in that if somebody is holding on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is who deserves their name to be mentioned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's where um, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would mention even their names to the malaika and and, uh, and 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 even praise those people and with the with the presence of the malaika. And that's the true that's the true praise and that's the true importance of holding those positions. Um, we'll continue next week, inshallah, with the with the rest of the ayat. I know we. I was really hoping, and you could see that I was talking fast and hoping to finish that. But I guess we'll continue next week. But I'll answer the questions that were um, sent, inshallah, in the in the in the time, inshallah. So we'll right here. Um, We'll do that next week, inshallah. Um, let's see the questions. At the time of the Prophet, when the ayat of tahrim of alcohol or zawaj were revealed and someone and someone became a Muslim after that revelation, was the ayat of tahrim applied or gradual? Um, so this was this was actually a concern that the Sahaba had, and then the ayat revealed that the what they had done and the things that they had done previously when the tahrim when the when the ayat did not yet prohibit um what they were doing that they weren't going to be included so that wouldn't be a sin unless the ayah was revealed and that was a, something that happened during the time of the process and the, the ayat were revealed in regards to that and here's a another question and for zawaj if it's a new muslim he is allowed to have zawj al muta then after time he um, gets told that Islam cancelled all types of marriages um, except one. My main question is where and how gradual uh, graduality in Islam is applied? Does it include not to say the Haram Act to new Muslim is involved? Um, I'm not sure I understood that question, but if a person if a person is, is a new Muslim and was involved was in was involved in haram acts and then learns that this that this haram act that they must stop and then that they have to um, change their life you know you want to remember that when we're talking about a new muslim we can't necessarily bring all at them it, it it's a it's a process it's a gradual thing that they have to learn one at a time and we really have to put that um that 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 graduality or that gradual part in in teaching them how to accept islam so don't necessarily think that if somebody is a new muslim that they were going that they're going to take everything all at once and even the prophet sallam actually said that this religion is a solid religion when you enter it when you enter the deen you know go be gentle in how you you enter the deen and how you apply it on yourself because it's going to be a lot to actually tell the person okay right now you're going to wear hijab you're going to pray five times a day and oh everything in your life you're going to you're going to leave it um all everything and oh you're 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 married um you're going to divorce your husband right now and uh, you know there there are certain things and this really needs a mentorship with fiqh with somebody that is specialized in fiqh to see how and what is the the most important thing that they should be considerate of to grow in their deen so you can't necessarily uh, uh, consider that the person and unfortunately there were many times and uh, i used to go to one of the masajid and in the masjid they would they would teach them you know you got to wear the niqab you uh, avoid going to the maqabir make sure you don't do this and and the sisters were really and they were some of them were really three months muslim so three months muslim and you it's like a whole list and some of them were really given a whole list of do's and don'ts and i remember a number of these women that was a number of years back ago how many oh 20 years ago actually more wow 22 years ago wow man time passes by fast ya allah Anyhow, um, and they were really giving them a whole list <clears throat> of do's and don'ts, and a number of those women really left Islam because it was impossible. And that was a wrong way of doing da'wah, to give them like a whole list of do's and don'ts, and here you go, and it's like, it's a, it's a whole life to change. Don't expect that the person is going to change everything all at once. This needs mentorships. These, this needs somebody with, with fiqh and, 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 and basira to actually, um, uh, to, to actually, 
you know, and, and to actually help that person grow in their deen without, without taking everything all at once. You know, even even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he told Mu'adh, um, when he told Mu'adh, he said, he said the first matter that you're going to be uh, teaching them is really you know introduced to them is really shahada and then in whom if they follow you if they obey you in that then teach them how to do the salah if they obey you then teach them how to do siyam so here's here's that 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 teaching where the prophet ﷺ is teaching muadh in when he goes to yemen how he should teach the people Islam and how to do Islam. He didn't teach them all at once. Okay, now you did your shahada. Here's you're going to do salah. You're going to do siyam. And oh, plus you leave Islam will be chopping your head off. And oh, the second day, make sure you make an appointment and go do your circumcision. And can you imagine telling the person that just became Muslim to do all that at once? And oh, and plus uh, make sure you on Friday we're going to see you on Salat al Jum'ah. And oh, if it's a sister, um, you need to wear your hijab. So all your clothes, you're going to change all those. Um, and um, yeah, um, all your lifestyle, your friends. Oh, you're going to take uh, cancel your job. Um, you get you're going to have to leave your job. Um, if you're working such a job, so imagine, I- imagine you're going to you're really putting her in the biggest fitna that even a Muslim that was born Muslim that was born Muslim is 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 already struggling with those so to expect a new Muslim to change everything in their life is impossible this is not fiqh this is not fiqh all right um, here's another question uh, does that mean it's haram to ask for the end of time because the person is in rush to be in Jannah with everyone the question is are we are we really guaranteeing to be in Jannah well if you know it's, it's really <laughs> that's a strange question because can we really guarantee that we're in Jannah it's like oh I want to be in Jannah can't wait to get to the Akhirah to be in Jannah well this is living in hope and will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah so yes we would really uh, want to be in Jannah but can we guarantee Jannah well the the question is that scholars actually dis, uh, that actually that they discussed was the question can we wish death can we wish for death so the answer is no it's haram to wish for death it's haram to wish for death um and it's haram to ask for death and that's why we would make the dua allahumma atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanan and allahumma ahini ma kanat al hayatu khayran li wa amitni ma kana al mawtu khayran li ya allah keep me alive if life was good for me and bring me death if death if death was was good for me, and that's why we. So what about when, um, what about when Sayyidah Maryam was actually saying um, in 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 the ayah when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala quoted that she was saying, "Ya laytani mitu qabla hada wa kuntu nasim mansiya." I wish I had died before that, and then I would, and even totally be forgotten. So this is this is where. Remember when in the beginning of the session we said that these are these there are certain things that were considered as permissible in the past and abrogated in Sharia al Islam. This is one of the things that is abrogated. So we can't use that as an evidence that Sayyidah Maryam said, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha. I wish I had died before this. All right? Because in Sharia al Islam, Allahumma ahini ma kanat al hayatu khayran li. Ya Allah, if life is good for me, let me stay alive. If death is better for me, Ya Allah, take my soul away and make me die. All right? And that's why the best dua is Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirata hasana. Ya Allah, grant us good in this dunya and grant us good in the akhirah. Jazakum Allah khairan everyone and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd be happy if somebody wants to say something and, 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 and unmute and wants me to unmute them, I'd be happy to. So let me see if I can. How do you do this? Okay, here we go. So, if you want to unmute yourself and actually see something, go ahead. Sorry, you guys, I put everybody on mute while I'm recording. That way it won't, you know, some people, they wouldn't know that they're, that they're muted and they're, uh, that they are unmuted and the sound, you know, she'd be telling her kid, you know, go over there or do this or et cetera. And she would get embarrassed. Because everyone in public is actually hearing it. All right, so Jazakumullah Khairan, everyone, and Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. And I'm really proud um, to mention 
um, those names, Abdul Rahman, Kiri, and uh, Fatma Taba, mashallah, always coming in. Hamza is coming on always for our classes, mashallah. Very proud of him. Um, Dr. Hinna, mashallah, always coming in for this class. And Rahima, the beautiful Rahima. And uh, Sister Safa, mashallah, does not leave almost any class. And um, ZS, I'm not sure which one that is. But Zahabu, mashallah, she comes for every single, single um, Friday. And Zahara, um, Carrie, mashallah, the beautiful voiced um, um, girl with her sister, mashallah, Zahra. And I believe the other one was called Zakiya. Um, mashallah. Jazakumullah khairan everyone for attending. We'll see you um, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow I've got a lecture at around 7.30. Yeah, around 7.30. It's going to be about feminism. And then on Sunday, it's going to be a lecture. It's going to be a panel. On Sunday, it's going to be a panel. And there's, and I would really, hmm, I wonder why I didn't do that. Uh, there's going to be a number of different speakers. I would really recommend that you would join and listen to those speakers, especially Hamza Rahmoun. Um, there's going to be a number of great speakers. Um, um, a number of great speakers amongst them is Muhammad Hijab doing an awesome job, mashallah. Um, although sometimes I would disagree with him on certain things, but doing an awesome job. Uh, there's also, I forgot that guy's name, he's from Britain also, uh, as well. Um, but there's a, actually a number of different great speakers, so join them. Inshallah, there's going to be Hatim al Hajj as well. I forgot the rest of the names. There's probably like almost, um, I don't know, almost 20 speakers. And some of them are great, the, the greatest speakers worldwide. So I'd really join that. I'll put the poster up so you could register and and um, do what you need to do in order to participate in those lectures. See you tomorrow, Inshallah. And Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.